Hey folks, welcome. Uh, I'm Caleb and I'm here with Jose Vega. And uh, Jose Vega, I've known you for a while. I've seen you around at different things, but Jose Vega recently made international headlines all over the world because he confronted the vice president of the United States in the Bronx. Jose Vega had a run-in with the great, infallible, amazing Vice President Kamala Harris, who we are huge fans of on this YouTube channel, as you all are sure aware, and of course I'm being sarcastic. Uh, so we're gonna have just a chat here. Uh, Jose is gonna tell us about our confrontation. We actually have the video, the full video, where you can hear the full audio of what Jose said to Kamala Harris. Um, and then from there, uh, we're gonna go back and forth. We're gonna have a conversation. We'll probably be on here for like an hour. If you have a question for us, just shoot us, shoot us a super chat and that's the way you can ask me or Jose a question. And we are just gonna chat about it. So Jose, before we show the clip of your confrontation with Kamala, why don't you just uh, tell us what happened, why you decided to do it, uh, how, what, everything that led up to that moment in the Bronx. Then we'll show the clip and then you can tell us what happened afterwards. So there you go. Yeah, sure. I had I had just heard that Kamala was going to be in the Bronx. I, I just woke up in the morning. It was like 8.30 I wake up and I hear on the radio, I think it was 1010 News, Kamala Harris to visit the Bronx today. And I knew, you know, if, if someone like that is going to come to the Bronx, you can't let them get away with, with just coming here. And so I, I just decided, I, I literally rolled out of bed. And uh, the picture they use of me has my hair sticking out because because I did just get out of bed. So I, I photoshopped my hair to look a little bit better. So you might see a couple different pictures, one with my hair looking bad and one looking good. But anyway, I was able to sneak into the event. It was a private event. Um, it, people were pre-selected three weeks in advance. My understanding is that the people who were selected were people who were connected to the council member's office, the state assembly office whether they helped Joe Biden to uh, get votes here in the Bronx. And uh, yeah, so these people weren't going to be people who rocked the vote. And all these people were on a list. And as the way I got in, well, I don't know if I want to say that because somebody's going to lose their job if, if I say exactly how I got in. And they weren't even helping me. They just incompetency, really. Oh, but, wow. Now, are yeah. you from the Bronx your whole life? Did you grow up in the Bronx? I was born in the Bronx. I was born in Montefiore Hospital up on Rochambeau Avenue. I'm a South Bronx resident. Unlike AOC, who's not really from the Bronx, as many people point out, right? No, yeah, I, I, you know, honestly, I don't know. I mean, I, I've seen people say that she grew up in like a suburban household. I don't know that whole thing. I'd like to know about it, though, if she really isn't from here. Okay. All right. So you got in. Uh, Kamala Harris was there. Um, and then uh, we had this epic confrontation. So I guess I'll just show the clip right now. So there we go. Attention. It's about better health. It's about better jobs. And intentionally, it is about our families. This what about the families who drowned? Eight families drowned here in Queens. It could have been prevented if we had the right infrastructure. You are right, brother. I am right about I that. You are. And I the Chinese you have shown that, that poverty is a choice. So let me Why aren't we working with the Chinese on their Belt and Road Initiative? Okay, the bankers run and a dictatorship back, here. I comments, we I'm need to pass to Glass-Steagall back. But right now, let's talk about the agenda. No, the agenda doesn't address the fact that people are going to die if there's another hurricane. There's been planned shrinkage and benign neglect. Everybody gets their chance to talk, and everybody gets a chance to talk. We don't need that energy. Thank you. 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 Thank so that was the confrontation. Now, I, thank you for supplying that clip because that had your entire audio. And a lot of the video that went out, they only heard a couple things. But why don't you go over the highlights? Now, first of all, you talked about how people died in Queens because of a lack of infrastructure. Explain that to us. You know, lay that out to us. Oof. Well, let's see. I, uh, this, this goes back like 50 years, back when Roger Starr was pushing um, uh, planned shrinkage. So you know, there was a, quote, fiscal crisis in New York City where you lost uh, two thirds of the police force, two thirds of the fire uh, department. You lost two thirds of EMTs and teachers. The city was a complete mess. And um, that was all imposed, by the way, by the bankers. You had this Big Mac uh, authority, uh, the municipal assistance uh, 
uh, I for always forget what the C is. And um, so, you know, New York City is in shambles. And so Roger Starr says, well, the way we're going to fix it is simple. We're just going to abandon all these minority and poor neighborhoods. I mean, the Bronx is burning itself down anyway, right? So just let them keep burning down. So most of the firehouses that were pulled out of the city came out of the Bronx. I think like 11 firehouses were pulled out of the Bronx alone. And so you have President Carter um, talking, going to Queens during his administration saying, hey, you guys need to modernize your sewage, uh, your sewer lines, because if you don't, if you have a hurricane, people are going to be flooded because water is going to be coming up their toilets. None of this was happened. None of this happened. None of this was built. None of this was constructed intentionally to kill people. So when I say, you know, eight families died um, in Queens, it's because those deaths could have been prevented if we had competent leaders who had built the needed infrastructure 50 years ago. Yeah, well, you know, New York City is the richest city in the world, uh, supposedly, right? We're this home of Wall Street. But yet, I mean, the amount of poverty here, especially in the Bronx, right? I believe the Bronx is one of the poorest counties in the entire country, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. The The district I live in is the poorest district in the, in the whole country. Um, you do have a tale of two cities. I mean, you know, everything that everybody says, gentrification, this, uh, you know, de-urbanization, depopulation. Yeah, it's all happening here because... It's supposed to be just, you know, a rich man's playground. And then the, the poor people just kept keep getting pushed out and pushed out. And yeah, that is the state of, of New York City. So then the next thing you said, uh, I believe you said China has proved that poverty is a choice. Um, and uh, you also mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative. So explain that part of what you said to us. Yeah, sure. Well, because uh, recently China made headlines because they pulled out virtually, I think, their whole population out of poverty. And uh, the World Bank has a definition of poverty. I believe it's something like $2.13 a day. And the Chinese actually have a higher standard than that. So when they say they pull people out of poverty, they are way above what the World Bank dictates to be the international poverty line. So what is that? How do you pull 1.2, 1.3 billion people out of poverty when we have uh, 350 million people, like only a fourth of the population here in the United States, and half of us are living in in in, in squalish conditions where all you know, everybody's poor. People can't afford to have children anymore. What is that about? Wow. Okay. Now, um, when you said uh, the thing about a banker's dictatorship, what does that mean? So you have people like Felix Rohatton, and uh, he's been one of these main influencers in New York City. So a lot of money that gets collected in New York from, you know, whether it's property taxes or subway fares or whatever, a lot of it has to be, quote, paid back to the banks. And uh, we are just in perpetual debt all the time. And so Mike Bloomberg and Chuck Schumer, who are Wall Street's uh, lackeys, they've just been giving the bankers more and more power. So New York has shifted its focus from taking care of its people to making sure that it's making more money in a speculative sense. And so when Glass-Steagall was removed and you um, had um, this other, the Dodd-Frank Act that was supposedly supposed to replace it, um, you just had the bankers running wild with people's money running wild with speculation, and there was no more focus or development on the physical economy, the subway system, the health system, you know, uh, people's education, people's basic needs, all of that went out the window, and speculation came in. Wow. Um, now, uh, we are getting, we, are, we have two super chat questions already, so we'll get to that eventually. But um, I was also going to ask you about, you know, you did raise Glass-Steagall. Um, can you tell us specifically about Glass-Steagall, like what it is for people who may not be familiar with it? Yeah, it was an act that Roosevelt passed way back in 1933. It was part of his alphabet soup policies. And Glass-Steagall basically separated uh, normal uh, loan giving out banks and speculative banks. So um, a bank can't just take your money and then start using it to bet on stocks or Wall Street or whatever. Um, there was a separation. These two things are separate. Today, they're not separate. Today, they are the same thing. I believe your money, if you put it in like a savings account or a checkings account, it's used in, you know, betting and speculation. And so this was repealed in 1999. And some have said that this is also why you had the 2008 crash, that this was like when you got rid of that important foundation, 
this led to the 2008 crash. Now, don't ask me about that. I don't know about the connection between the repeal of Glass-Steagall and the housing market, but yeah. Right. What's well, that thing Roosevelt said about not not gambling with other people's money, right? Correct. That was, that was the Glass-Steagall Act. So then, so now that you've gone through what, what you said to Kamala Harris, what was the reaction in the room? Like, what was it like and what happened next? Because I think she said she was going to talk to you afterwards, right? Yeah, well, she didn't. I mean, uh, you know, for one, when I say the thing about reinstating Glass-Steagall, I do hear claps, but it I still can't make up my mind as to whether or not that was because of what I said or because that's when they start pulling me away. Hmm. And um, but, yeah, you know, you hear people clapping, of course, as I'm being escorted out the room finally. But there's an irony here where she says, you know, in a democracy, every voice needs to be heard. And everyone should have their moment as I'm being escorted away. And uh, I guess it wasn't my turn to talk anymore. So, mm. yeah. Wow. And, um, and you know, the audience was just kind of on her side. They were kind of scared. You're a disruptor there. But uh, what has been the reaction since? Because I've seen it's made headlines like all over the world. Fox was all over this. Uh, I saw that. Yeah, uh, I was so uh, surprised. I thought it just was going to be like something the local news picked up. And then that was that. Um, you know, but when, when I saw the New York post and the Hill and daily mail cover it, I knew, okay. And I guess I've upset the K hive, uh, which I oh, just wow. come to found out is like a thing. Um, you know, I knew there was a beehive for Beyonce. <laughs> and so I, I just can't fathom the fact that people stand Kamala Harris. I, I didn't know that, 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 that people actually found her appealing enough to do that. Mm. And, uh, yeah. So at first I had some real dedicated haters, going through my old tweets saying, look at the stuff he's retweeted. It's not even stuff I said. It's just stuff I've retweeted or liked. That's quote unquote problematic. Um, and then, you know, but then the support was immense. I mean, I had uh, people who, who are all about the Belt and Road, people who are like all about China, just retweeting and supporting my stuff. And so, and I also had a lot of people from, from you know, they whether they were like real heavy pro-Trump people who just don't like Kamala or, you know, real uh, lefties who, who just don't like Kamala also. Just, it was great. Great. Wow. And why do you think it, it touched such a nerve? You know, honestly, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's just how often do people, you know, get to intervene on a, in an office that's held with such high regard that it's, it's up there in its ivory tower. And I, if there was one takeaway, I would just hope that people took away the fact that you can do this. Mm. They're, they're not they're not invincible. They're, they, they don't sit in their ivory towers all the time. They are vulnerable and there should be more people standing up. Wow. Now, do you think you opened any minds? Because I think a lot of those Trump folks who like uh, like what you did don't particularly like the Belt and Road and don't particularly like China. They seem to tend to think Biden and Kamala Harris work for China or something like that. So do you think you you kind of penetrated uh, the, the left right dichotomy, you know, maybe inserted inserted some challenging views uh, into into the other side as well? I said, I would hope so. I mean, I, I can't say for sure. I mean, I don't know if there's some, you know, hardcore right. I don't know if Ted Cruz saw it and was like, hmm, well, now I want to do the Belt and Road. I, <laughs> I, I, I sincerely doubt he, he did that. But I, I, I hope somebody can be like, hmm, what is this Belt and Road thing here? Well, and the fact that it got so much play shows that there was a feeling uh, on some part of the media, I guess, that, that you should be highlighted. I mean, that, that seems to indicate if nobody agreed with you. Uh, they wouldn't have, you know, they wouldn't have gotten so much play. They would have downplayed it or at least re omitted that part of what you said. You know, maybe they would have would have shown like the first part where you shouted. But it seems like that quote about the Belt and Road really stands out. That's the part that that got a lot of play in Daily Mail and other things. So yeah, because who says that? Like who who says? Yeah, I mean, here in America, who I I, I swear, I mean, other than, than 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 us, I mean, I I don't know anyone else in America who stands up to politicians and say we need to join the Belt and Road. That's like mm -hmm. the, the last thing on Americans' minds when, when it comes to what they want to debate about and talk about. Yeah. So, I mean, the fact that the fact that you raised that and then that that got highlighted indicates to me that maybe behind the scenes there are some political leaders who realize that, you know, making China our enemy is a pretty stupid move as their economy is growing and ours is falling apart left and right. I mean, that's what I, I hope that I see here. I hope that this indicates behind the scenes there's somebody with some common sense when it comes to China. Um, now, what, when you raise the issue of infrastructure, what do you think of what Biden's doing with infrastructure now? He's saying we need to lower our expectations. There's, 
these negotiations going on? Like, what do you make of the infrastructure plan that Biden's pushing out? It's just the same old deal. I mean, you know, Build Back Better is the same old deal. The Green New Deal is the, the same old deal, too. Um, you know, when you look at the language of what he was saying, uh, we are going to cut poverty down. OK, we are going to cut the cost of health care down. He's not saying he's going to eliminate it. We're just going to get rid of less. People are going to there's not going to be as many poor people as there was before. Mm. Um, so it's like his intention. It's as if he's saying, well, look, we can't make everybody, you know, wealthy. We can't bring everybody out of poverty. We can only bring some of you out of poverty. And that's better than nothing. Right. But, you know, people have been saying that for about the last 50 years now. So it, it's just it's just bullshit. And. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, the, the war on poverty under Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and then, you know, we had the, the, you know, the welfare state reforms with Reagan and then Bill Clinton. I mean, what what will it take to get rid of poverty in the United States? Well, if the United States really wants to be so hard headed as to not join the Belt and Road, well, we need to return back to um, having a national bank and passing Glass-Steagall. We need to use this idea of credit. And this is what Hamilton talked about when he built the nation. So there were two models when there were when when the foundation of America was being made and this was hotly debated. Jefferson wanted to keep the agriculture which was just a, a polite way of saying the slave economy and Alexander Hamilton said no, we need to rely on development. Hmm. And so you you need is you need to restore your economy to a point where you're saying okay, our focus needs to be development. Because the greatest resource we have is people. Mm -hmm. A person is your most productive thing and they're the most creative thing. And if you invest in them, you can then revitalize the U.S. economy. And so what does that look like? Well, for one, you need to bring back hospitals. Mayor Bloomberg, in his three illegal three terms, um, shut down 19 hospitals in New York City. A lot. Wow. Yeah. And there hasn't been a new subway line built except for the W train, the yellow line that goes from 96th Street down to Wall Street. It's just for the yuppies who work down in Wall Street who get their own personal train line. I, I mean, it's it's kind of you know BS that we don't have a train line that connects um, the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn. If you want to get to Queens from the Bronx, you have to go into Manhattan and then into Queens. And... Um, you know, so yeah, you, you just need, oh, and, and, and my, my favorite thing, of course, is you need a space CCC. You need a modern day CCC, a civilian construction core. Mm -hmm. You need to take young people who are in these uh, drug infested communities who feel as if they have no other choice but to join in on the bad influences in order to make a living, or they want to, you know, become a, a Twitch streamer, which, um, uh, you know, it's incredibly hard to do. It's like trying to become a basketball player um, and or they want to get Instagram famous or, 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 or famous off social media. And you have to take them away from their neighborhoods and you have to say, look, we're going to make you into something. We're going to give you the skills and tools you need to build what your neighborhood needs. You need to repair your subway system your hospitals and your schools. You're going to build schools where millions of people are going to be born long after you're dead and schools where millions of people are going to be educated after you're dead. And then you're going to go around the world teaching them how to do the same thing because wow. then you give people a purpose to be alive right now. And you give them something that no one told them that they were allowed to have. That way you save them. And then you can save our retiring generation too because the, the old uh, uh, foremen, assembly workers, welders who are now retired, you know, we're losing them too. And so they can teach the new generation. They can pass down what they know. And so you can get a generation of engineers building maglev trains around the country, you know, just a real CCC. And they get paid for doing all of this. Their families at home get paid and they get paid. Um, that's how it should be. Great. I, I can't disagree with you in any way. Uh, I think that's what we need more than anything. We need to start investing in our population. We need to start building in America again, instead of tearing yeah. things down. It seems like we have an economy where the way uh, corporations enrich themselves is by destroying things. Whether it's you know those those pharmaceutical companies that have made so much money off of getting people hooked on opioids, 
uh, you know, the prisons for profit, you know, prison industrial complex. Uh, I mean, it seems like, uh, you know, you had that housing market speculation crash in 2008, 2009. I mean, it's just like the way the way the corporations are making money is by tearing things down. Whatever happened to building things, right? I guess we need we need government action to step in and start building again in this country. But now I guess we can shift the conversation a little bit over to the person that you uh, that you uh, confronted. Uh, so Kamala Harris, what do you make of Kamala Harris? You know, the the office of the presidency and the vice presidency, I mean, Cheney has shown that the vice president can actually in some ways have more influence than the president. And uh, Kamala Harris, as a person, has shown the complete opposite of how you can just hold a title and not do anything with it at all. Um, I think she's just there in case Biden takes a, a permanent nap, quote, mm -hmm. you know. And I think her and Biden are both just pawns for people who actually are controlling what's really going on um, as to who's really c controlling what goes on. Well, I can't really answer that. But I just know that a lot of the policy that they think they're pushing isn't really coming from their heads. It's not coming from their minds. Yeah, well, I mean, I wrote a book about Kamala Harris uh, because I, I did kind of a study of her personality and her origins. And when you look at her rise in California politics, I mean, this is a, a very, very evil person. I mean, this is a, a person who tried to keep an innocent man on death row uh, because uh, she thought it would be good for her career as a prosecutor, tried to block evidence. I mean, this is a person who who locked a lot of people up for smoking marijuana and then laughed about about it herself on the Breakfast Club radio program. Uh, I mean, and her relationship with her father is also very interesting. There's a lot of questions there. Her father is an economist uh, who was an advisor to Michael Manley, who was the uh, the president of Jamaica, and uh, and uh, then you know has denounced her and said that he calls her campaign a travesty of identity politics, uh, and and uh, and denounced her after she made a joke about Jamaicans smoking weed uh, on on the radio. So. Um, it, it, it's very, very interesting to see where she came from. You know, I mean, there's a lot of questions about her role in California politics when she was running the the prosecutor's office in California. I mean, she was she was constantly being called out. Uh, you know, the district attorney's office was constantly being called out. You know, for concealing evidence. Uh, there were drug lab tests that were, you know, giving false positive results, and they didn't give that information to the defense. And I mean, she was determined to lock people up and destroy people's lives in kind of a vicious way. I mean, when I look at Kamala, I see a very, very dangerous person. What do you see? Oh, I mean, I completely agree with you, and I think Tulsi Gabbard was right when she called her out on the on the um, the, the pre presidential debates. Um, you know, she she just straight up said, you know, what you said, right? Keeping a man. Uh, who was in death row there, even though he was innocent. How many, like 1,700 people she locked up because of marijuana charges, which is now legal in most states. Um, and I think she even supported that that legalization policy. I, I, I can't, I, I don't know that for sure, but um, it just goes to show the kind of people who who run this country because she is, she is, she is just like a small part of a bigger painting that shows, you know, all these people are fucked up in some way or another. And having a vice president who's probably always under the influence of marijuana, because she, I think, also admitted that she, you know, right, because on the Be Breakfast Club interview, she admitted, you know, that she's done it and she does it, right? And I had someone tell me that she was probably high at this thing here in the Bronx, too. Um, she was only here for a few hours, too, by the way, when she came to the Bronx. Uh, she did her thing and then she left. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, what I find to be very odd is I remember when Barack Obama was running for president. I mean, we learned everything about Obama, about his school in Indonesia, about his parents and their life story and dreams from my father. And uh, we learned all about how, you know, how he had had this pastor, Jeremiah Wright, who was controversial. And it was like, it was like, we learned everything. There's nothing about Kamala Harris. Oh, she was a senator in California. Now she's vice president. And Biden, who's really old and is looking like he might retire or worse at any moment, uh, you know, she's about to become president, yeah, very close to becoming president. I mean, it takes one little historical moment to make her president, uh, you know, um, and we don't know anything about, no one's talking about her. I mean, I wrote this book, Kamala Harris and the Future of America, digging into her past a little bit. But nobody seems interested. There's barely anything out there. It's kind of like we're just supposed to just accept her. 
The other thing is that she's wildly unpopular. I mean, the U.S. public does not like Kamala Harris. Tulsi Gabbard got more votes than Kamala Harris got in the primary. Um, and as I mean, the polls show Joe Biden is popular. He has a certain charisma to him. Not Kamala Harris. Uh, I mean, they're they're constantly trying to basically shove her down our throats. I mean, this chaos you're describing. I mean, I'm I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a paid operation. I think it's a troll farm. I think in California there's a troll farm of people who get paid to do it because I have never once met anyone who liked Kamala Harris. I, I'm just being blatantly honest. I've never met anyone who thought she was she was just awesome. You know, I never have. Um, and I could probably say though that if if she wants to prove that she's a human being. I'm more than willing to sit down with her and talk, even well, if nothing comes of it. I, I do. I really do. Because if I doubt she'd do it, but if she really did, I have a um, a woman who almost drowned. Her name's Danette in Queens. Wow. And I, because um, I'm, I'm also working on a documentary and uh, we, she invited us into her home and we recorded her. She walked down in her basement and she went there to try and save the stuff she had in her basement as Hurricane Ida was hitting. And uh, what Danette describes is that she closed the door thinking it would keep the water out, but then the door just gets busted open. And then the water is now up to her neck at this point. Wow. And so she has to crawl out of this tiny basement window and wow. she's, you know, she's not, she's not a small lady. Right. And so there's water coming in and she's saying it's sewage water that's coming in and, and uh, you know, she gets pulled out by her blind son who hears her cries because he comes from upstairs down, and then he pulls her out because she couldn't do it herself. And so if Kamala Harris wants to sit down, I'll bring her with me. And then we can have an honest discussion about actually how to fix it, if, wow. if Kamala wants to prove she's human. Wow, I mean, this is the United States of America. This is New York City. We can do better than this, can't we? Yeah, we can. I think we can do better than this. I mean, that's wow. That is that is an amazing story. And so I guess that's the first super chat question we get is, uh, did Jose speak to Kamala after? And I guess you're telling me uh, she said that, right? That's what she said. She would talk to you afterwards, but she did not. Right. Yeah, no, she did not. I mean, she was just saying that obviously to shut me up in the moment. She's like, and if you let me finish, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. It's like, oh, you know, I mean, at that point, I also saw that they were the guards were coming mm -hmm. and I wasn't I wasn't going to. Just say, okay, yeah, sure, I'll sit down. No, I mean, you know, she's got to be told, she's got to get used to the fact that people are upset. And, yeah. you know, these guys just think that you're not going to be polite, that they're the only ones who can be polite, and you just have to sit down and do as you're told. Well, maybe our audience should stay on top of her about this. I mean, why not start tweeting at Kamala? When are you going to talk to Jose, right? What's your, I completely uh, what's, agree. What's your, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, at Hose B Trigger. At Hoseby Trigger, right? So I mean, we should all be was tweeting. taken, yeah. Yeah, we should all be tweeting at Kamala Harris. When are you going to actually talk to Hoseby Trigger? Right? J O S B T R I G G A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, right? I mean, uh, uh, that's that's what should happen, right? She said she would. Let's hold her to it. Let's make her actually sit down with you. That would be beautiful. That would be awesome. You should bring me also. Fine, um, I will. I will. It'll be agopic. It'll be. It'll be. I won't. I won't yell at her. I really will have a try an honest discussion with her. And right. if, if, and, and I'll just say this too, like if we come out and the discussion's productive, I'll never say a bad thing about her again. Okay. Because right. we'll prove that she isn't just, you know, all for show. She's a real person. Very good. Very good. I hope it happens. I hope that uh, there's enough of a firestorm that could actually happen. That would be amazing. Uh, that's, that's my hope. I, I kind of have a feeling that Kamala Harris isn't too good off script though. I don't think that meeting would happen. You know, I interviewed on this channel uh, a pro-Palestine activist named Paul LaRudy. Um, and he met with Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris, after her first trip to Israel, when she was the district attorney, um, in order to give equal time, she met with some Palestine activists. And uh, he said that she didn't say anything. She just kind of sat there while they talked so she could say she met with them, did not ask them a single question, did not engage with them at all. Um, and then, you know, there's that classic clip of Kamala Harris uh, with Stephen Colbert. Uh, where Stephen Colbert asks her, hey, you told us that Joe Biden was basically a racist and a segregationist. Oh, yeah. Now you're endorsing him. And she just laughs and she's just like, it was a debate. <laughs> it, was yeah. a debate. it was a debate. And it's like, I've noticed that about Kamala Harris. I think if she ever did meet with you, there'd be a lot of laughing in that meeting. Because whenever whenever she gets uncomfortable, that's how she's been taught. She's been coached to cover up her like angry side is she just starts laughing. You know, she's been trained to start laughing when she wants to like rip somebody's head off or like, you know, you know, scream at them. 
uh, to cover her anger, she laughs. She has this like fake laugh she does. Um, and uh, the fact that she uses it so frequently, it comes up so frequently, uh, is, is a little bit interesting. Um, another thing I noticed about Kamala Harris, and maybe you want to comment on this, maybe not, um, is did you notice that during the debate she had with Mike Pence um, during the presidential election? Oh, is that the one where the fly was on Pence's head? Oh, yeah. That was the most important thing that happened. That was the Saturday Night Live sketch and everything, right? We were supposed to focus on the fly. But yeah, but during that debate, um, you know, she said she wouldn't take the vaccine if Donald Trump was supporting it. And obviously that's not her position now. But what do you make of that? Like, where did that come from? I mean, they're all just hypocrites. They're, they're, it's, you know, it, it is just a political machine that's meant, we just give me all your votes. I'll say whatever I need to say to appeal to the right crowd to get me the votes I need. And then that's, that's just, that's that. That's all that is. Um, you know, I, I, it, it doesn't surprise me at all that politicians never actually mean what they say. Right. And I, I, mean, I guess I said just, I wasn't going to take the vaccine because I don't trust Donald Trump or saying the vaccine's a hoax or something like that. They would take my YouTube account down. They would take my Twitter account down. You know? Oh, yeah, that's right. right. I mean, it's weird. But she on national TV, she said, if Donald Trump supports that vaccine, I'm not taking it. And it's just OK. She said that. And now she obviously is saying the opposite. The vaccine hasn't changed. This is the same vaccine than it was when she said that. So that just shows how weird things are. And why was she saying that? I mean, the whole thing was just very odd. It was a very well, I mean, you know, she also, <laughs> obviously she's taking it now, at least I hope, you know, I hope that wasn't all for show either. And it just, it's just kind of stupid too, because then it just assumed, what, did Donald Trump make it himself? Is he in the lab working 24 seven with these files <laughs> trying to figure out how to immunize people? Yeah. It's wild. So the next super chat question, and keep them coming, folks, if you got something to ask Jose or ask me or ask both of us. Uh, the next super chat question we got, uh, it's from my friend Shia, who's in Montreal. She said, how badly will Kamala Harris go after, quote unquote, extremists of the left and right if she becomes president? What do you think? I mean, I think I think it's just going to continue the same trend that we see in this administration now that they've kind of let this behavior in Silicon Valley just occur where you can't even talk about COVID. Um, you can't say anything like I can see why someone would not want to take it because that already right there, just me saying that skirts the line of, whoa, 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 what are you trying to say? Are you trying to say anything negative about the vaccine or about this or about that? You're just only going to see more and more tech censorship going on. I don't know if you know this. You probably do that. Um, it was revealed to me recently that Twitter gets requests from the from people in Congress all the time to take something down. Jack Dorsey himself was getting stuff from Adam Schiff. Hey, this guy needs to get off Twitter or you need to take down this tweet or this guy's account. And so when I found that out, I was like, well, what the fuck? You know, where, where the, the, all of this is controlled. They yeah. know what we do on Twitter. They know what we're saying. They, 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 they see us. And then, and then this other thing about people who were tweeting things out, getting visits from the FBI and, what is that about, too? Mm -hmm. All these under the guise of, well, you were threatening AOC or you were threatening Kamala Harris. And somebody just made a joke saying I could throw a tomato at AOC. Something to that effect. There was this Twitter account called the Human Rights Watch Watcher mm -hmm. who was visited by the FBI because they had made a joke tweet that had nothing to do with violence. And the wow. FBI said, oh, we just want to come in and check this out. Wow. Yeah. That is that is crazy. Um that is really crazy. It sounds like what you're telling us is that the internet is uh, just as fake as that town hall meeting you went to. Uh, it's just as staged, right? Uh, yeah. you, every so often someone gets through to crash the party like we're doing right now, but overall the whole thing is fake. Um, and that's that's the hard lesson. I think when, when social media was getting going, a lot of people really did believe, hey, any any post could just get as many likes and all of that. And it was, it was somehow some kind of cyber democracy or something, but it's clearly not the case. It's a very, very controlled, uh, controlled uh, web, I guess. Um, that sounds like. So the next question we got, um, and, uh, you know, like I said, feel free not to answer if you don't want to. The person asked, uh, uh, it was it was Finn, uh, who's a regular viewer here. He said, uh, what are your favorite Marxist theorists and why? So what are your favorite Marxist theorists and why? Uh, you know, I can't say I'm a Marxist myself. Sure. You know, I've read some Hegel and Marx myself, but uh, just by default, because those are the only two that I've read. Those two are my favorite people. OK, and I'll go. leave it at that. 
All right. Well, there you go. I have you know what else is uncontroversial? Alexander Hamilton. Oh, okay. All right. Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've seen the musical, so there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but no, no. I mean, do you like the musical of Hamilton? Is it any good? Or, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to sound snooty or snobby. I, I only listen to classical music. I mean, I do only listen to classical music. Occasionally, I might, I might put on some Wu Tang. Um, oh, okay. You know, just because. But, um, you know. Yes, I, I actually did kind of like the musical. I got, you know, on a personal level, I don't speak for anyone else. I don't speak for, for what I, the words on a personal level. I like some aspects of the musical. Um, I like how they were able to explain some of Hamilton's early policies um, and letters to Congress in song. I thought that that was pretty creative. Um, so, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I watched the Disney thing, the, you know, that that's what I watched too. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I will say some parts of it I found to be extremely hokey. There was some whole thing about the room where it happened, you know, and it was just kind of silly. I just thought it was hokey, but there's some parts of it I found to be extremely powerful, uh, you know? Um, and uh, you know, I mean, and, and I will say for a musical, I mean, musicals tend to just be like, you watch like Jesus Christ superstar or, you know, uh, you know, the Lion King or whatever, a lot of emotions, but not a lot of story. They had a lot of detail. I'll give them that. There was a lot of detail in that musical. You know what I mean? I mean, it was, you, they take you through his life and a lot of detail, um, which musicals generally don't have. So I'll give you that. And I know, um, I believe some friends of yours have published some of Alexander Hamilton's economic writings, which uh, that, you know, I, I enjoyed about the case for a national bank and, and such. And I believe was, was Hamilton, he was key in setting up the, uh, the lighthouses if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, yeah. I actually did a tour of these lighthouses, and that that was a big surprise and shock to me too. I had done a tour in New York City where we got on a boat and we went around Staten Island looking at all these lighthouses, and I found out Alexander Hamilton had a hand in setting these up. Um, I don't know exactly why. I can't tell you why. I just know he did, and um, I should probably look into that. You know, why is it that the you know these founding fathers were pretty interesting too? Because Thomas Jefferson was also looking into dinosaur fossils and stuff. And oh, wow. yeah, I, I didn't know that either, that these guys were also archaeologists. And th these people were real, you know, um, uh, Renaissance men. They, they, they would do it all. And they were uh, they were religious skeptics largely as well. I know uh, Thomas Jefferson published his own edition of the Bible. Uh, it was only the New Testament. And he left out all the miracles. Um, and it was it, the idea was to preserve Jesus's message but not have the magical stuff that would not be believed in future generations. And really? Wow. Called, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's called the Jefferson Bible and you can buy it on Amazon still. And it's just, it's just Jesus unfiltered, just what he said. No, no miracles, no, uh, no healings, no, 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 no rising from the dead, nothing like that. So that, that, that's interesting. Um, and uh, I also, you know, Thomas Paine, he's not, you know, I, I don't think he signed the declaration of independence, but he was the kind of the agitator. Uh, of the American Revolution. I know he called for a guaranteed uh, universal basic income. You know, he was kind of a uh, an Andrew Yang kind of guy almost, right? I mean, that, that was kind of neat, you know, when I looked Oh, wow. Him. I didn't know that either. There's UBI back then in the family with Thomas yeah. Paine? I, he wrote a pamphlet, something called like the care of widows and orphans. And he basically argued that, uh, I forget the name of it, but something like the care of widows and orphans, arguing that there should be a fund in every city um, and that every family or citizen should be given a payment to make sure they have what they need, which I thought was pretty neat. Um, and uh, slavery was the big question that divided the, the founders of the United States. Uh, you know, that was that was the big question, right? Because Hamilton was an, was an abolitionist, very opposed to slavery, and went as far as wanting to recognize the government of Haiti when they had the slave revolution. He wanted the United States to have relations with the slave revolutionary government of Haiti, which I think is a, that was a very bold stand. Can you imagine taking that position back then? I mean, goodness gracious, right? That would not have gone over with a lot of people, right? As yeah, and I, but, but just real quick, uh, Somebody actually just reminded me something. Oh, sure. Because I'm 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 part of the LaRouche organization, and that question of who who are my favorite Marxist theorists <laughs> does Lynn 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 LaRouche was a big time Marxist once at one point in his life okay. when he was writing under Lynn Marcus. Why well, did that come to me? I don't know. But right. yeah, I just okay. wanted to uh, on on the Haiti thing. You know, I don't think enough people know about the fact that Alexander Hamilton helped write their constitution. No, real, no kidding. I didn't know that. Wow. I'm, I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to say anything wrong here. Uh, Ale I, I'm going to look this up now. Alexander Hamilton, Haiti Constitution. I'm, I'm like 90% sure that that's true. Yeah. So he supported that. He supported the Haitian Revolution and he helped draft. 
Haiti's constitution and advocated open trade with the new nation. There we go. Okay, so I'm right about that. Wow, that is, I, I didn't know that much. I mean, I knew he was sympathetic to the Haitian revolution. I didn't know, wow, that is that is very amazing. Yeah. You know, it's wild because for a long time, Marxists in the United States used to sympathize with Jefferson, right? Earl Browder, who was a big communist uh, during the 1930s, he, would, he, he argued that there had been the Hamiltonian counter-revolution and that Jefferson was the real voice of the American revolution. But that's been largely reversed. Uh, you know, um, uh, Christian Parenti, uh, who was, you know, the son of Michael Parenti, uh, he wrote a book called Radical Hamilton. And now in Marxist circles, it's largely Hamilton uh, who's admired among the founders of the fathers of the United States, which I think is, is uh, has a lot to do with your organization. I mean, your organization has been beating the drum of Hamilton uh, for many, many decades. And I think that may have, you know, filtered into the, the Marxist movement. I mean, that book, Radical Hamilton by Christian Parenti and, and now the musical and all of that. I mean, I think it's been reversed, uh, you know, but during the 1930s, I think one of the biggest mistakes the Communist Party made is they actually had a, one of their training schools uh, in New York City. They called it the Jefferson School, oh. uh, you, you know, in honor of oh. Jefferson, because they had this idea, you know, Jefferson's rhetoric about the yeoman, about the small farmer, it sounded kind of Marxist because he was for the little guy or whatever. But at the end of the day, that was just kind of, you know, that was libertarianism in essence. He was calling for, you know, you know, keeping the uh, keeping the an agrarian economy, not for industrial development. And uh, it was also kind of settler populism, too. I mean, it was, you know, it was, you know, it was the, you know, drive out the Native Americans and such. And so, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, Jefferson was not really, really a good guy. I mean, he no, was, he was not. I mean, you have Hamilton who Hamilton and Governor Morris and Governor Morris, I have to give a shout out because he he is a native Bronx uh resident you know there's morrisania and morris heights they're named after him he penned the constitution he wrote the preamble those are his words and um him and hamilton you know people say the founding fathers were all slave owners and they, they all were you know like foaming at the mouth racists but uh morris and hamilton wanted to include a no more slavery in the constitution uh, and Hamilton wasn't even just calling for anti-slavery. His whole economic system was saying, no, we can't live off an agricultural slave society only because we're going to lose money. It's not productive and you will not develop a nation that way. Wow. You need to develop and invest in people. That's the Hamiltonian model principle in essence. And that's what I think the LaRouche org has been calling for uh, forever. Okay. Very good. Um now, uh, if anyone else, like I said, if anyone else has a question, we've been through the first through, uh, three questions. So if anyone else has a super chat for Jose and myself, uh, they can shoot it our way. I uh, wanted to just get your opinion on some other things. We'll probably go on for another 18 minutes or so. Um, wanted to just get your, your opinion on some other things. Uh, you know, there's some concern about war with China, right? And the testing of these hypersonic weapons. And uh, are you are you concerned about the danger of, of war because uh you know, <laughs> well who isn't concerned about the danger of war because the only thing it's going to end with is nuclear war you can't you can't when you in, in an age of of nuclear bombs and hypersonic missiles you can't fight a war with two nations who have those capabilities with boots on the ground it's just it's just going to escalate very quickly to strategic nukes i mean this and and this is all being provoked by these uh, war hawks here in the United States that, and, and, and this goes way back all the way to Kennedy too, because Kennedy had generals on his shoulder telling him, look, Mr. President, we can launch a strategic nuke at this base here in Russia. We can wipe them out the map before they even knew what hit them. And they didn't realize that the Russians, there was no way you were going to do that. It, it was always going to end. Uh, I think uh, Eisenhower said, the only thing worse than losing a nuclear war is winning one. Mm. And yeah, that's that's where we are today. So yeah, I'm concerned. And I think that the United States should join with the Belt and Road Initiative rather than trying to uh, uh, compete with China because that's just only going to end in war. And yeah. um, I would also say, you know, I guess me and my, my soapbox here telling the United States what to do. That's why you know, you're here. To, yeah, to stop bullying other countries with their with their money because you know these sanctions starve people to death. I mean, look what they're doing in Afghanistan right now. They have they've frozen the funds in Afghanistan where the Afghani people can't use the money to uh, buy medical supplies or food or anything like that. So you know, I think just yesterday or today, um, I heard something like eight children starved to death in a hospital because both of their parents had died. Wow. And they couldn't get any food. So they just 
starve to death. I mean, what is that? And then this is all to say, well, because the Taliban shouldn't be running the country. Yeah, what? So you're just going to genocide the whole people this way? Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, there's 29 countries that are subject to U.S. sanctions right now. That's not a small number of countries by any means. 29. And, uh, you know, and obviously these countries have to still buy stuff. They have to still import products. And so now they've arrested Alex Saab, uh, this Venezuelan diplomat they grabbed in Cape Verde. And he's in federal prison in Miami awaiting trial. And they're going to try to they're going to try to try him for money laundering, for trying to help Venezuela import food from Iran. It's pretty unbelievable. Uh, you know, how, how extreme they've gotten uh, in their policies. Uh, it's, it's pretty horrendous uh, what they're doing. And, you know, that's why you know, there was a great demonstration in Union, Union Square yesterday to free Alex Saab. Uh, there's many people around the world. And it's an important case, but it's similar to what they did to Meng, uh, the C CFO of Huawei. You know, they detained her in Canada. It was the same kind of thing because they alleged that Huawei, the Chinese cell phone company, does business with Iran, then they, they grabbed her and wanted to bring her to the United States to stand trial. China and Iran are allowed to do business with each other. It has no business for the United States. I mean, it's pretty unbelievable. Wow. You know, I mean, what, what else? You know, you, you heard about this Bitcoin thing in El Salvador, mm -hmm. right? Now, I, I am by no means a proponent of it at all, mm -hmm. but I get it because what they're doing is they're setting up a kind of backup system because El Salvador and the United States have this kind of to the public, we'll say we have good relations, but really the United States is just looking for any reason to bring down President Bukele. Mm. Um, and so this Bitcoin thing is if they're ever, and this is just what I think, but I think that this is definitely what it is. El Salvador recognizes the fact that the United States has weaponized the U.S. dollar. And so they are looking for an alternative mean on if that were the case, how can we still support our people and our economy? By using Bitcoin, I thought it, it, I would have thought that they would have just used their old currency. But you know, it's a creative solution to hell. If we're sanctioned, at least we got something. But just the fact that countries have to figure out ways to continue to thrive in the case that the big bully United States decides to punch down and say, you know what, your money's worth shit now. We're not going to give you anything. That they have to use Bitcoin. I mean, what is that about? You know. There you go. Well, we have another question. Uh, thoughts on other projects the U.S. could collaborate with China on or other socialist countries for that matter? Oh, yeah. Easy. Simple. You go to Afghanistan and you actually do what you needed to do way back in 1989, which is build schools, work with China and Russia in Afghanistan by building hospitals, building schools, invest in the people and population. That's what you do. That's how you're going to fix up Afghanistan real quick. Okay. There's no reason why people should be starving to death over there. And then when you make it work over there, work with China, Russia, India, and you go around the whole world and you start taking names, you start saying, okay, what do you need in order to thrive and be successful? Okay. You could do, a, you can usher in a new era of global cooperation and of worldwide development. Excellent. I think that's, very, very excellent. Um, you know, we've raised on these streams before the idea of the Sandino Zapata Economic Corridor uh, to develop Central America with uh, the United States teaming up with China and Mexico and Nicaragua to uh, to build a, uh, you know, an economic corridor down through Central America. And that would be a way of dealing with the crisis on our border right now because people keep coming. I mean, the migrant waves are just getting bigger and bigger. Um, and uh, that's one thing we've raised. Uh, the other thing is we put forward this idea of fusion city, the idea of having all the fusion energy uh, scientists in the world combine their efforts in one giant international facility uh, that could be built so that when fusion energy comes, it's not the property of just one country. It's, it's you know, the property of all humanity. That's a um, great idea. Yeah, that's one proposal we've put forward as well, fusion city. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't know why we would want to make China our enemy. I, I can't think of anything stupider than making China our enemy right now. Oh, because it challenges the um, the the the, the uh, what is it? The rules based order mm. that exists right now. You know, you have the oligarchs, you have people in Great Britain, the city of London, and Wall Street who like to profit off the fact that people are poor and dying right now, and the Chinese Silk and Road Initiative. All it shows is that, that that's all bullshit. We don't need to run the world this way. That everything they say about that there's too many people on this planet, that, um, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, that you can't have everyone living at a decent living standard that you need, uh, that you can't have public health for everyone. It shows that those are just lies and it's bullshit. And um, when you see these anti uh, Belt and Road uh, articles come out, you know, they're all paid for by these people who feel threatened by it because their time is coming up. Um, it's like the the mask of the Red Death, you know, that post story where the guy comes in with that mask and then he just kills all the people who thought they could hide away in their castle from this disease that's killing everybody. You know, time's up. And, all right. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Pushed the wrong one. All right. Here's a question from Finn. Uh, he said, how and why did you join the LaRouche movement? I was 15 years old. I just came to a meeting that they used to have here in New York City, and I didn't understand anything at all that was said. I mean, this is all new to me. I mean, I was only what, like a, a freshman becoming a sophomore because it was in a it was in the summer, and uh, you know, I guess my mom was working two jobs, so she wasn't supervising me. So I was getting into trouble with these political organizations, going to these meetings and stuff. And so I just kept coming back because even though I didn't understand it, I remember one of the things that that Lynn would would emphasize and i would ask him this on the phone i never got to talk to him in person but he would always say that you know it, it's the british um and so i remember on one of their thursday night calls i was like well, how do you know it's the british what do you mean by the british and he's like i've been doing this for 50 years you're not gonna know and he just shut me down completely and i was pissed off i was like give me an answer damn it i don't know what the hell you mean by that hmm. but you know, just by sticking around and and really understanding the principles and being awakened to the world. I was like, OK, you know, these people know what's up. And I'll just say this. One of the things that really cemented my role here was I was this was whew, three, four years ago, 2018. So it was three years ago. I was 19 years old and I lived in another apartment in the South Bronx where my ceiling had filled up with sewage water because I was living in a basement apartment. And it filled up with sewage water and um, it just caved in. And the landlord said, yeah, I'm not going to do shit about it, just to be straight up with you. Uh, if you leave right now, um, we can rip up the lease, pretend like you were never here. So I didn't accept that. So I went to Bronx 12, the local news here. They covered the story. I went to my assemblyman's, excuse me, no, my council member's office, Fernando Cabrera. And at first, his chief of staff was very helpful. He was able to get the housing authority there real quick. They told me they were going to be there in a week. He got them there the next day. Okay, great. Awesome. And so I said, all right, what's the next step? How do we fight this thing? You know, I'm not the only one going through this. I know that there's other people in the Bronx going through this. And his chief of staff told me, uh, Fernando Cabrera's chief of staff told me, well, what if it's the case that someone approached you and gave you $15,000 to let all this go? Hmm. Like, what do you mean? You know, fifteen thousand dollars isn't gonna move me out of anywhere. And besides, you know, this uh, this landlord can't keep getting away with this. He owns multiple buildings. He, he, you know, this guy should be in jail. And he said, "Yeah, well, you know, you're not really gonna change anything." I was like, "Well, you're a council member. You know, do something. I'm not the only one going through this." I was emphatic with him. I was telling him, "I'm not the only one." He's like, "Yeah, well, you're the only one in front of me right now." And I'm telling you, you should take this money and use it, you know, buy a lawyer or something and, and or organize against this landlord or something. I don't know. He just, it's like, what, what the hell is this about? Where am I supposed to go? I was homeless at that point. And that really opened my eyes to the fact that all of this is controlled and all of this is bullshit. And the only people who were right about what was going on was the LaRouche organization. And then you know, I saw their solutions to this and I said, this is, this is it. This is right. You know? Because it isn't just a councilman, council member's problem. You know, he's just like these 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 firemen to put out people like me, you know, who want to do something to change. He's like, nope, we're just going to kill it right here. And this goes all the way to the top because they want to keep the Bronx the way it is. Good. Well, uh, you know, I think that might be a great place to end the interview because that's an interesting, interesting story about your background. Uh, good on you for confronting Kamala Harris. Uh, and I hope more people will do that. I hope more people will hold our elected officials uh, to account and ask them real questions, like why won't you join China's Belt and Road Initiative? And, and I, I want more people to do what you're doing uh, from many different organizations, from many different perspectives. Uh, you know, uh, that, that would be great. And I'm with you on the infrastructure, absolutely. Um, and I'm with you on, uh, on the Belt and Road Initiative and getting along with China. 
Uh, I think we have a lot of common ground here. So yeah, it's really been great to have you on. Do you want to end by saying anything? Uh, anything that you want to conclude with? Yeah, all I'll say is I think more people should stand up. You know, if, if there's anything, you know, I'm not, I'm not some big time, whatever. I'm just doing what everyone else should be doing. And it, it is a little scary at first, but when you stand up and something comes out of your mouth, it's easy after that. And I think if this happened once or twice a week in different parts of the country where people are just interrupting Biden or Harris or Chuck Schumer or any, or Nancy Pelosi, just interrupting her and telling her what is the what that's, that's what should be going on. Oh, just so everyone knows, the reason I gave it the title scaring the crap out of Kamala Harris is because it's Halloween is coming up. I, <laughs> it's seasonal. I just wanted to be clear about that. Right. That's why I gave it that title. Uh, I thought interrupting Kamala Harris wouldn't be as as cute. No, so it's I, okay. People should scare her too. Well, I guess she was scared, but well, she's yeah, she's scary enough as it is. I mean, look at her record. I mean, she's terrifying. So, uh, but I just thought that was kind of a fun Halloween theme to give this. Well, good on you for doing that. Uh, people know where they can follow you on social media. Uh, I hope that meeting um, happens. I really do. I hope that meeting follow up meeting happens. Thank you for everything, and I guess we will end. Thank you very much.